order. <laughs> I love doing that. <laughs> I really don't have to give a long introduction to our guest today because you all know him familiarly as Michael. He is, of course, the Right Honourable Michael Ancrum, Queen's Council, Member of Parliament for the Devizes constituency. And we have returned him with an increased majority time after time. He has been Deputy Leader of our party, he's been Chairman, he's been every role you could possibly think of until he's had enough and decided of his own free will to go to the back benches. And one reason he whispered to me was that now he can say what he wants, as he wants, and when he wants. Whereas a minister, you're rather tied. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you Michael Ancrum, my friend and our MP. Harry, thank you very much for that suitably brief introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I think I'm partly to blame, perhaps, for there not being as many people as you'd expected to come, because you asked me about nine months ago for a, a Sunday when I knew I was going to be free in the constituency, and I looked at my diary and this date came up. What it didn't say was it was Remembrance Sunday, and that's why I was in the constituency, and that's why I was free. Uh, so I think if anybody feels that we shouldn't have held it on this day, I take total responsibility for that. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here. I'm here totally in a personal capacity, and I make that absolutely clear. Uh, I, I am on the back benches now, uh, at my own request. It allows me to do a number of things which I would not be able to do. I'm still pursuing my interests in what I call exploratory dialogue, which I learnt in, as a minister in Northern Ireland when I was sent to talk originally to the IRA to see whether we could bring them into the process. I'm trying to do that now in different ways in the Middle East, which I would not be able to do if I was still a front bencher. So uh, as I've got to the stage I've got to in my political life, I'm hopefully being able to, to do things which are going to be constructive and useful, uh, but are not necessarily all part of the promotion of the party, which was so much of my life when I was the party chairman. And today, uh, in a sense, I'm relieved I'm going to not be talking about the, the credit crunch and the international banking crisis. We've spent most of the last month talking about it. Uh, I sometimes get the feeling that this is the moment when politicians realise the limitations of their knowledge about economics. Uh, we all know what the problem is, but none of us seem to have a ready solution to it. Uh, and I wanted today to move away from that and to talk about a different topic, which I think is uh, equally important so far as the future of this country is concerned, but hopefully to do so in a way that is going to move out of the, the normal arguments about Europe and to put it in a context which I think is going to be vitally important if we're to see the changes made that I want to see made. Uh, the title I chose uh, for this talk was Our Relationship with Europe. Not within Europe and not within the EU, but our relationships with Europe. Uh, I see and have always seen Europe historically as a continent of different nations bound together in a landmass alongside which we as an island have gained much over the centuries from European infusion and influence, but have remained geographically and psychologically apart. None of us can deny uh, the European elements of our own history. Uh, 1066, we were taken over, if you like, by the French with a little Norwegian influence, and that has lived with us uh, since that time. Before that, the influence of Rome in this country was equally enormous. So as I say, although we're an island and an island apart, we have at the same time benefited from the influences that have come to us from Europe. But when I talk about Europe, I talk about Europe as a continent. I've never seen Europe as a country or a nation in its own right, any more than I see Africa as a country or a nation in its own right, or Asia as a country and a nation in its own right. I know there are some who do. Uh, there are people who still talk about the, uh, uh, the idea of building the United States of Europe. Mostly these are politicians in various European countries rather than in this country who noticeably are very loath to consult their own people about what they're trying to achieve. These are the same politicians and political leaders 
in 2001 at Laken, next door to Belgium, in Belgium, next door to Brussels, in the famous declaration, started by saying the unification of Europe is near. And it was quite clear from that document that these particular political leaders did envisage Europe moving towards what at the end of the day was going to be what I would call a country called Europe. But they not only failed to ask their own peoples about it, but in that very same document, they admitted that there was a disconnect between European politicians and the peoples of the countries of Europe, and that they had to do something about it. And what was quite extraordinary was that Larkin had led into the process that led to the European Constitution, which, if anything, moved people further away from the whole concept of Europe, and certainly nobody was asked about it. And what is equally ironic is that on the evidence of the few occasions when other European peoples have had a chance to speak about this, the referendum in France and the Netherlands and the recent one in Ireland, and most recently the general election in Austria, which was fought to a large extent on the European issue, those people have shown that they don't want to go down the road that is being proposed for them by their political leaders, which is why, by and large, they're not asked any more than I have to say we've been asked. We were all promised a referendum at the last election by all the parties, and by some sleight of hand, and I say that as a lawyer who has studied not only the Constitution, but also the Lisbon Treaty, which we are told is not the Constitution, the differences between them, as far as I can see, are mostly semantic and certainly very limited. I have no animosity towards Europe, or even towards the original concept many years ago of the EU. I would be happy to see a European Union of sovereign nations trading freely between ourselves, working together on matters of national interest and common, sorry, matters of common interest and mutual benefit, but retaining our rights of national self-determination. That was the Europe that I understood many years ago when I was coming into politics was the Europe that we were going to become involved in. And I believe that that partnership of sovereign nations is still a concept which has a value if it can be achieved. And that's really what I am about. I don't think that this is a time to get into a massive row with Europe. I don't think that that, at the end of the day, is going to resolve anything except to find we split ourselves within this country even more than we have in the past. What I want to see is a calm, non-histrionic, measured approach between civilised and mutually respectful nations. What I want to see is a mature relationship within which we can avoid the enmities of the 19th and early 20th century, within which if some want closer association and integration with each other, then they can do so. I've never had any objection to the concept that France and Germany might want to integrate more with each other. If that's their, their judgment and their people want to do that, why should we stop them? but equally within which they cannot impose their aspirations on others who don't want to go down that road. And that, to me, is the key test. And I want to look at that relationship in greater detail in a moment, for there can be no doubt that today we've moved away from and beyond the concept that I'm talking about to a position which, in my view, has passed beyond the bounds of acceptability and about, some, about which something must now be done. Before coming to that, I want briefly to look at the wider context within which over these next years we as a country will be operating. We live today in a world which for the first time in the last hundred years is moving away from the concept of blocks. Do you remember we had the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc and we've now got the superpower Bloc of America and the growing Bloc of China. We are beginning to move away from that towards less rigid concepts of spheres of influence we're moving away from confrontation to dialogue, and if I can put it in this way, we're moving away from building walls, which was so much part of our history in the last century, but to what I now hope will be building bridges. It's sometimes described as the move away from hard power to soft power. And what in the end of the day it's going to require is much more flexibility and much less rigidity. It's a movement which I believe we will see strengthened by the accession of Barack Obama to the presidency of the United States, because in all that he has said so far in terms of international affairs, he sees the need to move away from the hard power of the last few years towards the soft power, which is going to recreate the beneficial interest of the United States in the world. 
It's also a world within which we are seeing already not only the growing economic influence of China and India, but at this very moment of illiquidity in our global banking systems, the growing importance and relevance of the highly liquid sovereign oil funds of the often tiny Gulf states. And I set this context because one of the major arguments of those who wish to achieve the unification of Europe, to use the words of the Larkin Duck Declaration, or even the ever closer union of the current treaties, has been the need to compete in a world of large military and economic blocks. And yet today we see tiny countries, Kuwait with 1.2 million citizens, Oman with 3 million citizens, exercising enormous influence because they actually have the wealth to do so. And the concept that you have to be big and you have to be in a, in a power block is no longer the argument that can, can, can be made with any certain degree of strength behind it. And now that the world is changing, the main pillar of the platform of those who talked in terms of blocks is fading with it. And that's why it's absolutely the right time in my mind to look at our relationship with Europe and where we would want it to be. The EU from its inception has been a one-way ratchet to ever-increasing integration. And those who pretend otherwise, and have pretended in the past, were quite simply disingenuous. I have to admit, for a time I was prepared to go along with it, subject to it still being the in the within the confines of the partnership of sovereign nations of which I spoke earlier, and I made that clear on a number of occasions in Parliament. And also, I was prepared to go along with it, so long as it had within it the mechanism and the means whereby the ratchet could be reversed. And for a short time, the concept of subsidiarity seemed to provide that means, and it led me to support the Maastricht Treaty some 15 years ago, something which I have to say, with the benefit of hindsight, I now regret. In the 16 years since that treaty, the ratchet, far from reversing, has ground inexorably onwards through the subsequent treaties of Amsterdam and Nice and more latterly Lisbon. And the EU within which we find ourselves today may not yet be fully integrated, but it's moved way beyond the concept of the partnership of sovereign nations. And when you examine even the treaties before the Lisbon Treaty, the idea that any of the nations can be regarded and described as being sovereign nations is one which I think you will see is false. It has crossed the threshold of what I previously called the gateway to the country called Europe. And if again you read the Lisbon Treaty, that country called Europe is the objective which is firmly within its sights. It was not accidental that the architect of the European Constitution, upon which the Lisbon Treaty is based, the former French President Giscard d'Estaing, spoke of it in glowing terms as the moment philadelphique. To him, it was echoing the provenance of the original United States Constitution. And he made no bones about the fact that this was not just a device for managing a, a European Union of 27, but this was the beginning of something that was going to come, become that country called Europe. And that was the moment for me, the step too far, when the European Union became unacceptable and the need for change became imperative. The European Union with which we are faced now is not one with which I believe the British people would wish to go along, nor is it in the interests of the British people that they should do so. It was already, and we know this from our own personal experiences, over-interfering and over-bureaucratic. Uniformity was and still is imposing rules and regulations on us, which while they might have merit in some other parts of Europe, in our context are irritants and unnecessary restraints. And those who impose them are largely unaccountable. Our sovereignty is being salami sliced away from us into the hands of unelected bureaucrats in Brussels. And I watched this in Parliament, I've seen it as a lawyer, and I don't think that anybody can argue that that is not the case. The cover of the Council of Ministers and the rights of veto which were built in to some extent disguised this. But the Lisbon, and the Lisbon Treaty and the Constitution which preceded it threw that disguise overboard. The EU, if the Lisbon Treaty is implemented, will now have an unelected president, nominated indeed, but not elected by the peoples of Europe, an unaccountable foreign minister with a full EU diplomatic service behind him, and a whole series of areas where we have got powers of veto at the moment quite simply removed. 
On one view, this concept is a mirage in a Europe where the reality is the not-so-hidden Franco-German agenda of European dominance by them as the central bloc, with the rest of Europe following behind. And I don't blame them for seeking that. As a historian many, many years ago, that seems to have been the history of Europe over the last three, four hundred years. And I don't think much has changed, but I think it's important that we see that there is a context when Angela Merkel and President Sarkozy get together as they frequently do. It is something they are quite openly trying to pursue. The EU with which we are now faced, the EU of the Constitution, of the Lisbon Treaty, of the gateway to the country called Europe, the Europe which has become a bureaucratic machine whose victims are sovereignty and democracy, is in my book quite simply unacceptable. There has to be change. Further integration is not an option. And doing nothing and muddling unhappily long is also not an option. The converse of integration is disintegration. And it's interesting, that word, because you can pronounce that word in two ways, and the different pronunciations matter. You can have controlled disintegration, which can be positive, or you can have uncontrolled disintegration, which is normally destructive and negative. And it's the first of these which we should be encouraging, because if we fail to do that, I believe that sometime in the future, the second might happen very much to the damage of us all. I've always taken the view that a successful Europe does not need to be uniform. Various parts should be able to associate with each other at different depths and levels. And that is what used to be called the Europe of variable geometry. What it might lack in neatness, it would almost certainly gain in each participating member being more comfortable with the level that they have set themselves and the partners they are working with. There is no reason why the Europe of the future should not include an integrated inner core, a less integrated middle layer, and an outer layer of associated members, which could include such future members as Turkey and possibly us. And I'll come back to this. If there is to be change, the process towards it will need to start now, and it will almost inevitably have to start with us here in the United Kingdom. There are, to my mind, a number of clear steps, which will, of course, depend upon the Conservatives being the government after the next election. And I make that point not in a partisan spirit, but the government we have at the moment has stated quite clearly that it is not prepared to go down the, 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 the road of reform. And if we are to see that, 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 that further integration avoided and the process of changing the form of Europe, then the government will have to change as well. If by the time of a new government the Lisbon Treaty has not been ratified by all 27 members, and when I say that I mean, in fact, Ireland, which is the only member that is not formally ratified at the moment, the treaty has, uh, and the treaty has not been implemented, I believe that we should hold the promised national referendum in this country on that treaty, informing our European partners that in the event of a no vote, the British Parliament will revoke our previous undemocratic ratification. And that would effectively kill the Lisbon Treaty and would require the whole EU issue to be reopened again. Because one thing I think is quite clear is that a Europe of 27 cannot be governed by the treaties as they stand at the moment. And that, in my, to my mind, would be the time to campaign with, I believe, increasing support in the rest of Europe for the changes I've already outlined. I spent some time about three years ago travelling around Europe, talking particularly to the new accession countries, the countries of Eastern Europe who just come in to the European Union. They didn't want to rock the boat. They said they were mem new members of the club. But they were very nervous about finding themselves on the periphery of an integrated Europe where the centre was going to be all-powerful. And they were interested in the concept of a Europe of different speeds and different levels. And I think if we get to that stage... This is a... I think if we... Should we turn this off? start anyway. This is a new, this is very much a new form of heckling. I'll try again. Uh, I, I believe that this is the time, because of that, when we can actually, in a very civilised way, begin to see how many other countries and parties within Europe we can get to join us in looking for the sort of reform I'm talking about. I'm going to speak without it. I hope that, the, the, that the, those who need to can hear me. 
What I was saying was that if we get to that stage uh, where we are able to hold a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, and if that vote is a no vote, then I think we tell our partners that the time has come to go out and to discuss the future form of Europe, and we can look for those countries and those parties within Europe who I believe will join us in trying to disintegrate the Europe that we have at the moment. If, however, by that time the treaty has been ratified by all 27 and implemented, then I have to say I think a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty would be no more than gesture politics. If we already have the European President and the European Foreign Minister and the European Foreign Service, for us to vote no isn't going to change that. And I think what we have then to make clear is that we explain to our partners that the post-Lisbon EU is unacceptable to this country and that we ask for a reopening and renegotiation not just of the Lisbon Treaty but the other treaties as well, including the so-called Aki. The implementation of Lisbon will be in practice and anything less than what I'm now suggesting would be unworkable. Our partners in Europe will then have a choice either to accede to what would be a polite and formal request and to begin an honest and open re renegotiation of the treaties, the results of which should then be put to national referendums, which would be in line with Larkin saying that Europe must be brought nearer to its peoples. And that requirement would almost certainly, I might add, ensure a less integrated result or a more variable Europe as the peoples of the majority of the member states have never shown any particular desire to have the fully integrated Europe that, that Lisbon sets out. That renegotiation process would not be one conducted under duress, as so many of the negotiations of the past have been, but should be one designed to produce a European Union better suited to the more flexible and less rigid world about which I was talking earlier. And I would argue, if I was in charge of our foreign affairs at that time, that Europe should be doing that anyway because the world around it is changing and it needs to meet those changes. That should be the aim. However, I have to say I suspect that our larger European partners, particularly France and Germany, would not accede to the request for a proper renegotiation of the treaties. They would see themselves as having too much to lose in terms of their current aspirations. In the case of France, this would be somewhat ironic as the French were the ones who most firmly voted no when they were asked of their views of the Constitution. But if that situation arises, if we find ourselves in a situation where our partners or our major partners refuse that renegotiation, that would not be an end of it. In those circumstances, my proposal would be that we would then ask, once again politely and formally, for the UK to negotiate with our partners our own position within the European Union. If the European Union remains unacceptable to us as it is, then we need to change our relationship with it. We cannot, as a country, and a democratic country, sit back and do nothing and allow ourselves to be dragged along a path which, according to Larkin and according to the treaties themselves, is going to end up in, in something which we ourselves are not prepared to be part of. I don't fear applying, if we had to, for associate membership, allowing the EU to proceed on its integrationist course and for us to maintain our financial and economic limit, links to it, but able to retain our rights of self-determination. It would not be in the long term great for Europe, I suspect, if we were to take that position, but as far as I'm concerned, it would be all right for us. And if our partners were to say no to that, which would be a very substantial thing for them to do, then we must always retain the option to walk away from the EU taking our checkbook with us. And I've always taken... I've always taken a very simple view about Europe, that there are idealists, but they're also pretty hard-headed. And the idea of them having to pick up the tab for what we have paid into Europe over these last years is going to put enormous pressure on them. And I think if we were ever to reach that position, you'd find our European partners would be thinking very closely about the damaging effects it would have on them. In the end, what all this boils down to is the right of self-determination, and self-determination is often called sovereignty. You can pool sovereignty for a particular purpose, as we have for half a century and more in NATO, and you can do that because in the end of the day it's retrievable. What governments cannot do is to alienate or surrender sovereignty irretrievably, 
at least not without the express consent of the people to whom it ultimately belongs. Sovereignty is not held by parliament. We talk about sovereign parliaments. Sovereignty is only held in trust by elected parliaments and the governments that spring from them. It remains vested in the people and it can only be given away with the consent of the people and if the people are not prepared to give that consent then no government has the right to give that sovereignty away. And nor is sovereignty a legal principle to be bandied about in the small texts of the treaties. Sovereignty, as we've learned through our long history, requires to be asserted by people and parliament, and it's that assertion rather than anything legal which is then acted upon. It was suggested to me the other day that the European argument was no longer particularly relevant to modern politics. With respect, I have profoundly to disagree the argument is about what sort of Britain generations to come will inherit. Will it be a region of Europe or a proud nation in its own right? And I'm not using hyperbolic phrases here. I use the words that are used within the treaties and the Larkin Declaration and other declarations. That, in the end, will be the choice. And I sometimes find it ironic that those who say that that doesn't matter are often the same people who assert the sovereignty of Georgia and of Tibet, and of Kosovo, and think nothing at the same time of giving ours away. I go back to what I said earlier. The Europe of the future would be a better place for embracing the variety which throughout history has fired its culture and its philosophy and its influence. For our part, I see much merit in being on the northwestern end of Europe as the associated member that can best provide the transatlantic bridge between America and Europe and the bridge with the Commonwealth countries as well. And I see at the other end Turkey performing the same role with Islam, with Israel and Asia. It would mean great change, but the world is changing greatly and we in Europe should be ready to change with it. And if that is to work, then any change in the future shape of Europe, unlike the past, must be underpinned by democratic consent. In the week when in America the democratic voice of the people has spoken so clearly, so decisively and so excitingly, we in Europe should be prepared to accept the challenge of letting our peoples decide our future as well. And we in this country should lead the way in making this possible. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Michael, for an expert analysis of the situation in the world as it is today and especially in Europe, a much vexed question. I think he has found solutions which would suit us and the rest of Europe based on a much more democratic principle. Michael has the right to express his opinions because of all the MPs I think he is the most travelled. He has been not just in Ireland but in every country in the world and even penetrated Zimbabwe though it meant death if he were found. So he's been there, seen it, decided for himself and made up his own mind. Now I think this would be a very good time to pause for refreshment and then allow Michael to rest and then answer some questions. First question. Well, what is the party line on this? Uh, could I ask, Chairman? Yeah. Well, it seems to be the whole question of Europe seems to be a, a sort of forbidden subject yeah. because the Conservatives are either mealy mouthed or not agreeing on what they're going to do. And he, I just wonder what the party, present party line is. The part, the and part. if I give you just another second to, think, to give me the answer, I don't know if you saw the other day <coughs> what Mr. Gorbachev, Gorbachev said about the European Union. He said he couldn't understand why the leaders of Western Europe were so determined to replicate, replicate the Soviet Union in the rest of Europe. And if you look at the EU dispassionately, you'll see exactly what he meant because it's um, corrupt, it's um, I'm not clear what, where it's going to, well it's clear where it's going to go, but it's, um, the other word I, I want, 
Um, and it, 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 it's a matter mind, of you put your greatest point, importance you put for your this point. country as to how it, how it deals with Europe. Yes. It's duplicitous, it's corrupt, and it's totally undemocratic. If I may interrupt, sir. Sorry? Um, there isn't time for long speeches. Well, it is. You've asked your question. You yes. must allow Sorry, I must allow your question. What was the part yes. the Where does Mr. Cameron stand on this? Can I start, though, by making a comment on what you said second? Because it is quite interesting. When I was doing my tour of Eastern Europe, uh, talking to the accession country governments, one of the reasons why they were keen not to see Europe becoming too integrated was because they had come out of the Soviet Union where they'd been dominated from the center, and they were not keen to find themselves in another situation where suddenly decisions were going to be taken a very long way from them and imposed on them. So they were interested in the idea of looking at that sort of balance I was talking about. But their view to me was, look, we're new members at the moment. We're not going to go straight in and start rocking boats. If we come to this, come back to us and talk to us about it. And I think that's something that we need to do. The party's position is, first of all, that the, the Lisbon Treaty is unacceptable what I said, and it, it has gone too far. Uh, we now have gone through that gateway to the country called Europe. If uh, the treaty has not been implemented, the party's position is clearly that we will have the referendum we were promised at the last election on the actual Lisbon Treaty. And if that hasn't happened, what the party is saying at the moment, and I use William Hague's words, is matters will not be allowed to rest there. And I think one of the reasons why then they don't want to go further than that at the moment, it's slightly like the economic situation. You don't want to take a firm line, find that circumstances have changed and you're having to reverse your position. I hope that what I said today is something that I can persuade the party is what they mean by saying matters cannot rest there. And what I've tried to set out is a set of patterned movements where we start off, in each case politely, and I go back to that again and again and again. This is not a matter of, of anger. It's a matter of trying to get the best relationship and set up within the European continent to meet the challenges of the next 50 years. And if we address it like that, I hope that we can get our partners to come with us. If we can't, as I say, there is the fallback position, which I find no difficulty in enunciating. But the party has gone as far as it's gone at this stage. I hope by the time we get to the next general election, we'll know what the circumstances are and we'll be able to come out more clearly with what we mean by matters will not be allowed to rest there. Thank you. Lady. How do you feel about Britain having to give up habeas corpus and use the European corpus juris, which is totally different to habeas corpus, isn't it? And we've got to give it up. If this Lisbon Treaty is all signed and all goes through, we then have to change. Is there any way that we can keep habeas corpus in Britain? Yes, I mean, we, by, by, not, by, by eventually not accepting the, the provisions of the treaty. You're right, that is a threat. But I have to say to you, the far bigger threat to habeas corpus at the moment was, thank goodness, dropped by the government, the 42-day detention. One of the reasons we had this extraordinary alliance across the parties about that was this was a, a not, not a European directive. It was a government decision to lock people up for 42 days without charging them, without telling them what they were even suspected of. And that runs totally counter to habeas corpus. And for that reason, people from all areas of the political spectrum opposed it. And I hope that that's now dead. I think Nick, where is that? Over there. Yeah, right. Nick. Thank you. Um, a lot of what you've said, Michael, has been dependent on a referendum uh, in order to change course. Have you, I, I've got no perception of what a referendum would look like. What would the question be? What would guarantee that we wouldn't get an emotional response to the question, whatever the question was, rather than a, que a, a response that was in the interests of sovereignty was in the interests of an engagement with Europe, the sorts of things you've been talking about. What on earth, what would the wording of the referendum look like? Well, if, if, if there was a referendum on Lisbon, I and mean, that's a fairly straightforward one, the referendum would merely say... How would I, as a, 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 an ordinary citizen of this country, understand the ins and outs of the Lisbon Treaty? It's a very complex question. Yeah, but I, I, and I don't think even I have bothered to read the treaty and the constitution, understand every single word of it. But it's about what, what, it, what it generally 
achieves, and that's the nearest you can get to it. You can see, I mean, I don't think you see there's any argument between me and people in Europe. There may be arguments between me and one of the more pro-European people in this country about what the Lisbon Treaty means. If I go and talk to Giscard d'Estaing and say, what did you mean by your moment philadelphique? He said, this is the beginning of the United States of Europe. This is why I've written it. And therefore, I can, in a referendum, say, do you want to go down that road, which is what the French want to go down, or do you not want to go down that road, which is the position that I'm taking? And that, I think, is something you can ask. That's one form of the question. The second form of the question is where we actually are going to surrender sovereignty. And I come back to what I said in my speech. I don't think that any politician has the right to do that without the express consent of the British people. You can get that in two ways. You can either do it by a referendum or you can do it by a general election. What you can't do is the position we're in at the moment, where it was not a question at the last general election. There is no referendum, but unless we actually do something about it, more of our sovereignty will be surrendered permanently. I think constitutionally that's wrong. And I, you know, I, 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 we look back, we had one referendum on Europe in 19, 1975, in which the British people voted by a large majority at that time to stay in what they understood to be the common market. We weren't all going around at that time saying, terrible thing that we asked the British people. We were all going around saying, good thing that we actually got it endorsed by the British people. But that was the last time we ever asked the British people a single question about Europe. And if you look at the, the, the Larkin document, and it's, it's interesting in its perspective, it itself admits that unless people in Europe are more prepared to become involved and understand and support what is happening in Europe, ultimately Europe will implode and self-destruct. And yet these same people say, but we mustn't ask the people. So my answer is we've got to find the mechanism if we're going to go down any of these roads, any of the, the, the options that I put forward. We don't have to ask them in advance, but we've certainly got to ask them whether they're prepared to accept the outcomes. Yeah. Isn't it right that the um, Irish have said no to the Lisbon Treaty in a referendum and they're now trying to, uh, in it, Brussels are now trying to uh, get them to say yes to the Lisbon Treaty? Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's not new because they did the same on the they did exactly the same on the Nice Treaty. Ireland, if you remember, voted no to the first of the Nice Treaties, and the Prime Minister got up and said, well, we'll talk to the Irish people and we'll try again. And that, to me, is not democracy. That's going on hammering away until you get the answer you want. Um, no, I, no. No, well, no, no is no. But I, mean, I, th I think at the moment, the way that Europe is constructed, the Irish could very well vote again. I hope if they do that we can encourage them to vote no again, because that would be the end of the Lisbon Treaty. And then we don't have to do that in this country. We can go straight to the next stage of renegotiation. But the, the only country that cannot have a referendum by law is Germany. Right. Because the constitution which was set up after the war because of Hitler's plebiscites deliberately prescribed referendums. Mm -hmm. But every other country in Europe is perfectly entitled to have a referendum. So why aren't they being allowed to have a referendum? Because, because their, their governments, and I go back to what I was saying, do not have the confidence that the people are going to support them in what they're doing. And they're probably right. And I would like I think to think that if, right. we, if we get into a renegotiation, part yeah. of the agreement with our partners in Europe is that we should test the opinions in referendums mm -hmm. of all the peoples of Europe on the outcome of those negotiations. And then whatever the outcome is, I'm a Democrat. I mean, if people in this country at the end vote to accept an outcome which I'd rather not have got to, I've got to accept that. What I haven't got to accept is a government telling me what is going to happen to my country through Europe without the people being allowed to have a say. I think uh, time has come when a hot drink would be a great help. Nobody knows of referendums anyway, do they? Any country that's voted, no. They just so we'll wait until after refreshing. Yeah. I can have some refreshment first. Yes. Do you see between the Rothschild and Rockefeller empires and the banking collapse in the world today? <laughs> uh, I, I, I suspect there is a. The, what connection do I see between the Rothschild and, and Rockefeller banking practices of the past century and the problems we're facing today? which is a, 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 an interesting historical question which I suspect would need a much more knowledge than I've got of those their banking practices before I could answer it. But I, I, it gives me a chance just to make a comment on, on where we are today. Uh, I don't know whether you noticed, there was a little bit in one of the papers that said I'd come to Margaret Thatcher's defence uh, last week, which I did. 
because certain people were going around saying, well, of course, the whole of the banking crisis was created by Margaret Thatcher because of the deregulation that took place when she was Prime Minister. And I pointed out that her mantra throughout her time as Prime Minister was always live within your means. And the reason why we ended up with the problem we've got today is that neither governments, nor peoples, nor companies, nor banks lived within their means. And if there's any lesson we have to learn, we've got to go back to living within our means. David? Uh, sorry, um, you, you said that if the um, Lisbon Treaty is not uh, implemented um, by the time Conservatives come to government, uh, then they would hold a referendum. Uh, could you elaborate on the situation if it is implemented at what the Conservatives' position would be. Obviously, they probably haven't thought about it too much yet, but do you have any inkling of what uh, yeah. they might do or might say? Uh, I've been asked what, 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 what our position or the Conservative Party's position would be if the Lisbon Treaty has been implemented by the time we come to power, which is what I tried actually to cover in, in my remarks. I think if that is the situation, there is no point having, this is my own view, a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. Because if you've already got a President of Europe and a Foreign Minister and all those bits and pieces in place, all ratified by the other countries, us voting here against it, which I suspect we would, would be nothing but gesture politics. It wouldn't change anything in Europe. If that has happened, we've then got to say, and we've got to start saying it now, you have created a situation which is totally unacceptable to us. And we are not going to sit back and just let that happen. We are going to ask you to renegotiate not just the Lisbon Treaty, but all the treaties, because once you put Lisbon in place, it becomes part of what's known as the Aki, and you need to actually renegotiate the Aki. Now, my suspicion, as I said, is that our partners will say no. I hope that perhaps what, what's happened over these last few months, uh, both in terms of finance and in terms of the development of international affairs, might make them think twice about that. They may see that there is a point in looking to create a slightly different Europe. But if they don't, then we've got to have the right to say we can renegotiate our own position in relation to the EU. Now, that's my view. The Conservative Party have said that they will not let the matter rest where it is now. And the reason why I think they won't go any further is because they want to see, what, and any, any putative government must do this on economics or any other thing, they want to see precisely where we are before the next election, before they say in our manifesto what it is they will do. It, but they don't want to say something. I mean, it's very, let me give you an example. I mean, we, we've been very cautious as a party not to go too far in terms of economic promises. But one of the things that uh, my party was talking about a year ago was sharing the proceeds of growth. And we talked about spending patterns and taxation. We said what we'll do is we'll share the proceeds of growth between uh, public services and reducing taxes. Sounded good, didn't sound as if we were giving any hostages to fortune. Suddenly this year, when growth has disappeared, it's meaningless. And in a way, oppositions always have to be very careful they don't put themselves in a position where because of a change in circumstances, a major part of their platform has to be rewritten. And I think in terms of Europe, I think it's, it's very important that William Hague and David Cameron have said we will not let matters rest here, which means that Lisbon will not stand and we will find the way that we deal with that as we get nearer the election. Yes, gentlemen there. I think your, what you propose to Mr. Ancrum is both reasonable and commendable. My worry is that is there anybody out there with a bottle to implement it? Yeah, I mean, because I don't think, you know, politicians, mm. you know, particularly in regard to Europe, I, in my mind, have let this country, uh, country and its people down. I mean, yeah, yeah. Po politics is about having the will to do things. Um, and, you know, too often in the past we sh we sh you shy away from something because there's a more important political priority and the will isn't quite that. One interesting if of history was if we had the Conservatives had won the last election, I was the Shadow Foreign Secretary and Michael Howard was the, the, the leader. He would have been Prime Minister and I presume he would have made me Foreign Secretary. Within three weeks of that election we would have been in the presidency of the European Council. And our policy was to move towards a Europe of variable geometry, which is partly what I was talking about earlier. And Michael Howard and I had not only detailed plans of how we would do that and the stages by which we would, we would do it with our partners. It, ultimately, we might not have succeeded, and then we'd have had to look at the other options I was talking about. But we were determined that we were going to go in, hit the ground running if we won that election, and start that process. 
And it does take that determination. And my job is to try and make sure that in my party, as we get to the election, the determination is there. Can I say something? Several uh, comments that are made to me and, and the audiences uh, have kind of denigrated people like UKIP, they've denigrated uh, any uh, uh, Eurosceptic or Eurorealist uh, organizations. And, you know, I have, that gives me doubt that really they were sincere um, in going for a, a reasonable solution with Europe. I mean, I, I don't want to make this a party political argument, obviously, but I mean, these changes can only be achieved by government. Yes. And therefore, you have to, one way or another, achieve a government or elect a government that has the will and the determination and the policy to do it. And voting for other parties that are not going to be the government uh, is, it, it may be allowing you to express your own opinion, but it's not actually going to achieve that main objective. And if I've got any criticism of UKIP at all, it goes back lot, long before the last few elections, but uh, Ian Sprout, who was the MP for Harwich, was the most Eurosceptic MP in, at that time in Parliament. He lost his seat by a majority of 2,000, and the party, I think it was pre-UKIP, I think it was the Democratic Movement, who stood against him, took 3,000 Conservative votes. And they elected, instead of Ian Sprout, a Labour MP who was violently for United Europe. And I just asked myself that question as to whether the people who did that voting actually achieved what they wanted to achieve. And I don't make that in a partisan uh, fashion. I make it because if in the end we're going to get change, we have to vote for the mechanisms to get that change. You want to ask? Um, yes. Um, I really wanted to say... Uh, can we hear the question, Sorry. please? When, uh, this is really, you've answered most of this, I think, really. When are the elected representatives, representatives of Westminster going to regain control of Great Britain from the Brussels dictatorship, and will it be by peaceful means? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to regain power back as, as elected representatives from the dictators in Brussels and will it be by peaceful means, I think was the gist of the yes. question. I mean, I, I hope you, you, you've taken from what I've said today. Uh, I, I actually am a great believer in dialogue. I think quite often we create problems by confronting each other. Uh, largely what I've done over the last 15 years in terms of the work I did in Northern Ireland, the work I'm trying to do in the Middle East, is all about going to meet people who we've confronted in the past and got nowhere and trying to engage them in argument and discussion until we get to a stage where even if they don't agree with us, they may be a lot more flexible in how we can deal with them. And I do think that within Europe, we talk about Europe as if Europe was a sort of monolith. It's not. You go to Hungary, you go to Czechoslovakia, you go to the Baltic states. They're all very pleased to be within the European Union rather than the Soviet Union. But none of them want to see themselves suddenly being subsumed into another highly bureaucratic centralized organization. But those are the people we should be talking to, and rather than it's us against Europe, it should be those of us who want to see a Europe which is a genuine partnership of sovereign nations, where we can retain our rights of self-determination, and those who don't. And then we can begin the discussion between those two groups as well. So no need to, 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 to come to blows over it. I just think that too often in the past we, we indulge in what I call megaphone diplomacy. We shout at each other from a great distance and then wonder why we make no progress. Uh, it has to be agreed by the whole, all the 27 countries, doesn't it, before you can actually change anything? Yes, but you, you can... You, as, How as would I, you ever get that, that agreed? Well, because uh, I think if we actually argue for a sensible Europe, you might find that, that the countries themselves, if their peoples were asked, would vote for it. I mean, we, we know that... The, if the people were Yeah, we, well, we know yes. that that was also part of what I said earlier. I mean, uh, the trouble with Europe at the moment is the peoples are not consulted. We know that the French, given the chance, would say, uh, would agree with what I'm saying. Yeah. So that's what we've got to work towards. Okay. Michael, as we know that the European elections are going to be next June, and it's highly likely that that will be before there is a general election, can we be confident that David Cameron will encourage uh, the Conservative MEP candidates to have similar views as your own? But one thing which he's already done is he's, he's withdrawing our, our MEPs from the, uh, the European People's Party. 
which we've been, uh, if I can put it this way, associate members of for some time. Where we've been allowed to say what we think, uh, but we've been part of a party which is actually a Federalist party. So he's made that absolutely clear, and that is going to be part of the election platform. Uh, and I think that we will fight this election, and it's a very good platform to fight on, on the basis that we are not prepared to go down that road towards a country called Europe. It's not what we joined, it's not what we want, it's not what the British people want, and I think that's a very sound basis for a campaign. Gentlemen the back. Uh, may I say I welcome your conversion, although I think it's, it's been somewhat late in the day. I'm no politician and I don't have your qualifications, but I woke up to what was going on in Europe years and years ago. Um, the Conservative Party have said many things about Europe. One of them was that before, uh, a couple of years ago they were going to pull all their MEPs out of the European People's Party. They didn't. They said we were going to reclaim the fishing. We, they've now dropped that as a policy. I think the Conservative record on Europe has been appalling. Mendacity isn't, isn't sufficient to describe it. And from your, the other point is gesture politics about having a referendum, even if Lisbon. I think you're absolutely wrong. I think it would give the most enormous signal to people in Europe or to the bureaucrats in Brussels if the Conservative Party were to say now that regardless of what happens to the Lisbon Treaty, we will have a referendum. Yes. I, mean, I, I know, sir, where you're coming from, and I'm not surprised that you say what you say, otherwise you would be part of my party and not part of the party that you're a member of. And I'm not going to get involved in, in party politics today because I don't think it's the moment for doing that. We don't yet know what the Conservative policy in relation to various uh, issues within Europe is going to be, uh, even before the European elections, because the manifestos have not yet been written. I'm not privy to what's going to be in them, and I'm not going to speculate on that today. What I am going to go back to saying is this. If we have a referendum in this country which actually achieves nothing, we diminish the value of referendums. We wouldn't achieve. Well, if, if the treaty is implemented, there is nothing that we can do by voting against that to dismantle what will already have happened right across Europe. And I think it's taking your eye off the ball. It's gesture politics, and it may be that uh, that is part of how you see the politics of the future playing out. I'm not interested in the politics of this. I'm interested in actually achieving a result. <coughs> if that has happened, I want to see us getting into proper negotiations which reopen the ACQUI, which is what the whole thing is about. And that's what I want to concentrate on. I don't want to spend four months running around the country saying, vote no against something which when you voted no is still going to be there. That seems to me to be a waste of time. I think we've really got to concentrate our effort. And that's possibly, if I may say so, you having used certain strong words, why you're in your party and I'm in mine. Yes. Um, Michael, the thing that worries a lot of people who are conservatives still, although some have temporarily gone to another party, I stress temporarily, <coughs> is that there is no evidence that the conservative leadership would carry on in the hopeful way that you suggest. There have been many instances, one within the last week, I think, when a prospective Conservative candidate expressed his views on Europe and was promptly sat upon by David Cameron. I wish to God the Conservative Party would realise the strong sense of feeling amongst a lot of people in this country, irrespective of their parties. You do make a great mistake by the example of Sproat, I can see the sense that logically it's all fine, but it's gone beyond that. The growth, most people in UKIP or a high percentage are Conservative members, and we touched on the other evening, you and I, would it be possible for people to rejoin the Conservative Party and still remain a member of UKIP? Well, obviously that would be too much of a gift to the, the present government. But I do think something along those lines would be very useful. But it's more important that somehow Cameron and the 12-year-olds in central office actually listen to the situation, listen to the country, because they don't. He only listens, just as Brown does, to what he wants to hear. And that might shake up the election. And I do you know, urge you, please, to give a bit more thought. That is not black and white. It's not UKIP and Conservative. So many Conservatives are in UKIP and some are hovering. 
And uh, when it comes to the point, if we could unite, we could only unite if the Conservatives take a stand. After all, if we get a Conservative government with a good majority, I'd like to think it would be fine, we'll save 40 billion a year, but I've got no confidence whatsoever that that would happen, and that does worry me, and many people. I, 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 can, I, I can only say what I, I've said. I can only say what I've said today. I hope I've set out very clearly what my position is. Uh, I'm not a member of the Shadow Cabinet, but I hope that over a period of time, and I'm not alone in the Conservative Party in taking the views I've expressed today, I can persuade my party leadership to more specifically adopt the sort of things we've been talking about. But, but what I can't do today is to stand up and say I, I can tell you what the policy is going to be when we get to next summer, because I'm not in a position to do that. I wanted to make quite clear what my position is, what I'm going to be pursuing, and you can expect, given that I'm a reasonably senior member of the Conservative Party, that I won't hold back from making my views as clear and as strongly as I can. A lot of what I said today, I said in Parliament in a debate on Europe some months ago, and the world, my Conservative world, did not fall around me. There were a very large number of my colleagues who came up and said, thank you very much for saying that, and will you go on saying it? And here I am today saying it again. Uh, so far as dual membership is concerned, uh, the only problem that we've got to be very cautious of is all parties have rules, and we've got to make sure that we don't actually offend against those rules because, in my experience, sometimes we found rather unfortunate happenings where people who didn't understand that they were going to find themselves deprived of membership did. And so I think we've got to be very clear of what the rules are before we get on that road. Yes, a lot of people have written to the Queen about the Constitution, I mean, that she's broken her coronation oath by signing this Lisbon Treaty. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Well, uh, again, what I said earlier, it's very easy to get tangled up in, in what I call constitutional arguments, and lawyers love it. I can promise you, normally when you do that, you see people's eyes glazing over in the room. Sovereignty to me is, sovereignty to me is what you assert. There were 40 of us in Parliament who, at the end of the ratification process going through, uh, voted for a motion to reassert the sovereign right of each parliament to decide the future of this country. And I think it was very significant. I was one of those 49 people. Because it's the assertion of it and what you do as a result of asserting it that is more important than the law. Because once you get into the law on an international basis, you'll find it's a very, very murky world indeed. And I say that as a lawyer who practiced in it for some time. But if we believe in our sovereignty, and I go back again to what I say, I don't think sovereignty is the possession or in the possession or ownership of Parliament. And by Parliament I mean the, sovereign, the, 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 the Queen, the Lords and the Commons. It belongs to the people. And it's the people who actually give it in trust to Parliaments every five years. And Parliaments, as good trustees, cannot alienate what they are given without the permission and consent of the people who gave it to them. Well that's, been taken away from us. Uh, well, that's why I'm arguing that you cannot do it and you should not do it without a referendum. I mean, I think, I, I think it, is, it, it flies in the face of everything we believe about sovereignty in this country, not the legal status of it, but everything we instinctively believe that we can alienate it without the consent of the British people. Dr. Lister? Can I just ask you? It's a, a relatively small but not an important point. We've had the common agricultural policy now for far too long. We've had a common fisheries policy for a similar length of time. Both have seen the ruination of these two industries so that we are left as a country economically with a population that far exceeds our ability to sustain. Does the Conservative Party have any idea what it's going to do? Yes, I, mean, the, 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 I think we must distinguish between those two particular policies. I spent a lot of time looking at them. Uh, the, the common agricultural policy at the moment is a disaster. But I have to say, as someone who's had interest in farming, that until about eight years ago, it was uh, a quick way of making friends with your bank manager because of the prices that Europe was prepared to underwrite all, all that you were producing. And so it, it was a distorting policy in terms of food production in terms of the agricultural industry, it was actually very beneficial. One of the reasons why Ireland has done so well recently was 
largely because a rural community took great advantage of it. It's, it's not working now, and it will never work again in the future because the whole way in which food is produced and marketed across the world has changed. And it's almost another example of what I was saying earlier. The world is changing. We have to change with it. And that's one area where there has to be substantial change. The fishing policy, I have fought against for as long as I can remember. I was a Scottish MP. I watched the beginnings of the destruction of the Scottish fishing industry. Uh, and I watched it then beginning to creep down the, 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 the North Sea. Uh, when I was party chairman, I went and visited the fishing communities in, in Devon and Cornwall and saw how it was being destroyed from the other end of that, of that particular part. That has been a complete and utter destruction of our fishing industry. Uh, I don't know if we manage to get out of it now, and I'd love to see us get out of it, and if, if necessary, I would do it unilaterally, and I would challenge the Europeans to challenge that in the European court, and let's see how far they get. I don't know whether there is still a fishing stock to restore the fishing industry with, but it has been one of the, ma the, the major things which I hold against the European Union is the way that they have done to our fishing what so many of them were not prepared to do to their own fishings in the Mediterranean. And there was a very good example of us being treated in one way and them being treated in another. And that's why, I, as I say, I, I, my anger with that is unbounded. Do you not see any culture in a similar position, though, so comparing the French farmer with the British farmer? Well, no, I, th I think the difference is that agriculture can come back. Um, you know, we... It isn't, it isn't that the fish, stock, the fish stock is disappearing. We can grow more here. Uh, I, I think one of the great challenges on agriculture, not particularly to do with Europe, is for, to have a government again that says that self-sufficiency is an objective to be pursued. It was the day that we said that self-sufficiency no longer mattered that we began to see our agricultural industry beginning to suffer. If we actually said self-sufficiency self mattered, and I think in the the modern world where food and water and energy are going to be the crucial factors in the future, I think we'd see our agricultural industry reviving substantially. I can't say that I see that for our fishing industry, and it really, really upsets me. Yes. Um, could you uh, advise us about, uh, I believe the Conservative uh, policy was to abolish the uh, illegally funded and undemocratic regional assemblies. Is that still on in, within the plans? Yeah, as, as, far as, as far as I know it is. I mean, the, again, the manifesto is not written, but I've heard nothing to say that that has changed. And I, if it's any consolation, I, I get frequent invitations to go and sit in on them. I refuse. I take the, I take the, the view that they, are, uh, that they shouldn't be there. They're unelected and uh, they, are, they assume authorities to themselves which they have no right to assume. I'm not going to waste time by going and listening to them. Uh, I got, I, I, I got a, a survey the other day saying, what did I think of it? And I wrote back, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Can I just, what is your opinion of GM crops? My opinion of GM crops is I, I, I'm, I'm nervous of them. I mean, I, I, I've always taken the view, I'm not going to say absolutely not, but I'm certainly not going to say yes until the science has proved to be safe. And at the moment, that's, that, is, that proof is not there. And I think we've got to be very cautious about going down what is a very tempting road because it's going to produce much more food, it's going to help produce food for Africa and everything else. But the cost of doing that in terms of its impact on health and everything else, we simply don't know. And I think we've got to say very firmly, and this is luckily the, still the position of my party as far as I know it, is that we are not going to support GM until such a time as the science has proved to be safe. We went to listen to Percy Schmeiser, who was a farmer, a Canadian farmer, a couple of weeks ago, and he's o he was over here giving a lecture, and he has had no end of trouble with Monsanto. Um, they threatened him. Um, just unbelievable what he was telling us. Um, they're so all-powerful, Monsanto, and they will take over everybody and anybody. Yes, I mean... That, that's, that's, I mean, that, that is one, one particular side of it. But the actual GM thing, I mean, we see GM around us. Nic Nicholas Soames, my colleague, said to a Labour member who was going on about GM, he said, do you realise you're a, G uh, a GM ape? Uh, that we were all changed and we, uh, we've become what we've become because of changes that have happened. And, you know, there is a, a, there is a grain of truth in that. Uh, but what we should not do is to go down a route where we don't know that the science is safe at the end of the day. 
Um, but also the powerful company comes into this as well. Well, it does to an extent, but in the end it's the farmer who's going to actually make, make those decisions. We don't want it in Canada. Mm -hmm. a lot of them. I don't think we want it here. No. Right at the back. <coughs> a lot more. Jim there hasn't asked a question. Uh, you've given us your particular view about the European Union, which I think is um, a sort of a minority view within the Conservative Party. Uh, as evinced by the fact that only 44 uh, Conservative MPs voted for uh, Bill Cash's uh, motion. Can you also give me your particular opinion about mass immigration and the fact, in my opinion, that the British, or particularly the English national identity, is, is being destroyed by this process? Uh, someone has uh, said to me that um, even if immigration was stopped tomorrow, because of the much higher birth rate of the immigrant population, and then the, uh, the indigenous population would be the minority by about 20,070. <coughs> so what was your view about, about that? Because the Conservative Party don't seem to be too, too keen on stopping it. Well, the Conservative Party, that is a policy that they have enunciated, and it's that we are going to set limits, as the Australians have very successfully done. And those limits are going to be based on what types of skills are needed in this country at any particular time. Uh, I, the other day, was making the point about Europeans who come here at a meeting, uh, where one person was at, and another member of that meeting said, hold on. He said, I can only run my business at the moment because there are people with those skills coming over from Europe, and without them I can't get those skills around here, and I would have to make redundant the other British people who work here. But, so we've, we've got to have a, a policy that is actually going to match what is needed at the time. And secondly, we've got to have a policy when, which, when it decides on those limits, makes sure that we have the amenities and the facilities to sustain them. Because one of the things I find very strongly, even in this constituency, which is not very uh, strongly affected, is that people are finding that it's more difficult for them to get houses, it's more difficult for them, for them to get onto GP lists because of the number of people who've come from, from, mainly from within the European community. We have got to actually create a situation where we only have the people in here who we need to have in here, and we make sure that we can sustain them when they're here. Well, on a lighter note, Chairman, is Brussels not just a sinecure for dodgy politicians? Yes. Um, well, some of them even come back and get dodgier when they do. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, you've all had a chance to ask a question, and the Chairman is going to take his opportunity. Uh, it's been made very clear to us over the years that the one great asset that the European Union and its supporters have is keeping the people in absolute ignorance of what they're up to. On the other hand, they've also spent a great deal of money, our money, supporting various groups which can differ as much as from Oxfam to the church with large sums of money winning their support. They use peculiar organizations called Common Purpose to help them move minds around and they are quite articulate in the, uh, their ability to move mental processes. How do we with our little resources left, tackle them. I think, very, I think, I think that, that's a very, very good question. I, I think that we have got to go back to what I was saying earlier and say that the primacy of any development within Europe is no longer going to come from Brussels, it's going to come from the people of this country. Hmm. That's the way we change that. At the moment, we have a, a one-way system of communication, as you say, which we largely pay for ourselves. And it's a very insidious one, and it doesn't often tell the truth. What we've got to do is to move away from that and start explaining to people on the ground what the options are and asking them to decide what they want. If we do that, we do something that Brussels cannot stand in the way of. Yes, John. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry we were late getting here today. We came up from Exeter. Two and a half hour journey took four and a half hours because of the rain. Apologies. Um, the reason I wanted to ask some questions of our uh, guest today is because, like you, I'm old enough to have been in the last war. I'm not quite as 
as, 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 uh, ancient, as ancient a warrior as you, Harry, but at least I was around during that war. And one of the things that gave me the utmost concern as the war was coming to an end was what was happening with the Nazi party. And it wasn't until I met you that you gave me the answers in your book, The Fourth Reich. Because, quite honestly, the Brussels regime is controlled by former Nazis now. Okay. So much so that you, Harry, described the EU as the GEU, the German Economic Union, the European Union. And the, the thing that worries me is that there is a degree of complacency, not with you um, as our guest speaker, but with David Cameron and the likes of David Cameron, that everything is going to be rosy. They don't know what they're up against. I've fought the Nazis and I know what they are. What they are. I'm old enough to have fought them. And I don't like to think that we are going to be suddenly subservient uh, to a lot of the uh, Nazi rulers. And it is something that is really rather frightening. Um, I don't have many more years left on this earth any more than Harry has. But I'll help Harry write his books until I die. And I hopefully Harry would outlive me and still carry on writing them. Because believe you me, it is, it is important that we as a nation begin to realise just how subservient we are to those villains who, that came from the Nazi party that decided they wanted to go for world domination and by cracky, they're doing it. And when somebody mentioned about the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, they were the people that put up the money for German, the German nation to buy out American industry. And that's mentioned in Harry's book as well. And not only are they, is Germany now the largest industrialist in the West, close to overtaking America at the present time. But also, they have the second largest army, 350,000 regular troops. They are recruiting conscripts at the rate of 50,000 every two years. And I've done some sums. They've either got 800,000 or a million men at arms. That is what we are up against, and it is something which I know that your David Cameron chap couldn't care less about, and it worries me sick, sick. I've been a Conservative ever since I was the first allowed to vote just after the war. And I don't pay a subscription anymore because I'm sick to death of it. <laughs> Not with you, but with, with, with the others. Yeah. I couldn't do it more. Well, and I, I also read very carefully what Harry writes, and so occasionally I write the foreword to what uh, Harry writes, and uh, he, he is always worth reading and reading very carefully. Um, I don't want to get into the whole argument about where, where Germany is at the moment, except to say this to you. What is very obvious is that although they have a lot of men under arms, they're not prepared to put a lot of them into supporting what we're doing in Afghanistan at the moment, and that is something which we should put pressure on them, because that is going to be a test of them. Secondly, slightly facetiously, you mentioned the GEU. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I thought it might be also a French version, the FEU, which spells F, which means fire, and perhaps we ought to watch out for that as well. But one point you make, and, I, I, and this is a very serious point, is there are two visions of what can happen to Europe. One is the visions of, the vision of those who built it, who were very largely um, either socialists or communists in the early days, who set up the, uh, the coal and steel uh, uh, treaties. Italian communists and, and, and uh, Belgian communists and socialists. Uh, and they saw this as being a command-driven system. And you're precisely right, those others who come from the other sides of the political divide who also take a command of totalitarian view of politics 
I equally see an opportunity within this to pursue it. But the sort of Europe I'm talking about, because we, we live in a world where Europe is there, the Europe of, of, of sovereign nations, a partnership of sovereign nations, which are driven by their own democracies and visibly driven by their own democracies, is the best antidote to that. And that's what I want, rather than sitting and saying, I don't like what's there, I, have, I mean, I'm coming towards the end of my political life too, but I'd like to use the years I've got to try and drive the thing in the direction that I think is going to remove the threat that you're talking about. Any more? No, you... No, no, one at a time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, John. Take your seat. Each person speaks once and let somebody else speak. Um, yes. I call wind farms or energy. It's pretty obvious that we're going to have a hell of an energy problem before we are told it. Wind farms, if one really looks into the facts, it's a complete waste of time and effort, other than for the profits at all levels, people who run them. It's not going to work. The Conservatives don't appear to be saying anything about this or pushing us towards nuclear, which appears to be the only sensible answer. And we all, as you touched on in the break, we are very, very vulnerable to French and German energy companies, to say nothing of Putin in the background. This is something that we sh the, I'd like to think the opposition, highly paid as they are, were to start earning their money. Well, I think, again, I mean, there is a policy on this, and I, I was looking at it the other day because we had a debate on it. And what we are saying as a party is that you need to have a variety of sources of generation. And that includes a major nuclear proportion, but it also includes a major proportion of renewables. And the reason for that is that, and, and you and I know this, the costs of the, uh, of the fuels for making energy tend to vary. And if you're going to have a sensible policy, you have to have a policy which at any given moment can take the best advantage of where the market is. I mean, when I began in politics, oil was very cheap, and we started building oil-fired power stations. When I was 10 years later on the Energy Select Committee, we were mothballing them all because the price of oil had rocketed up. Uh, same has happened with coal in the past. Nuclear, we, we do, there are costs which have still got to be borne in terms of what you do with the waste. I've never been uh, of the view that it's impossible to find a way of dealing with it, but it's going to cost money, so there is an on cost there. But I actually think we need to have a substantial nuclear capacity within this country. Yeah. And to those who say to me, ah, but where are you going to put them? For a start, let's put them on the sites of all those existing ones that are now being decommissioned. Where I, I was up at one the other day, and the people there said to me, we're used to having nuclear in our area, we're very happy to have a new nuclear power station. And I think if you look at what the Conservatives are saying is we're not going to say all renewable or all coal, which is what the Labour Party would like to see, or, or all nuclear. We're going to say you've got to have that balanced variety of generation because that's the best way you serve the interests of the people of this country. Yes, you You said earlier that in the last analysis... We could always take our checkbook and leave the EU. Sorry? We could always leave the EU if necessary. Do you think that this could result in economic sanctions being imposed? Yes, I think, I think there would there'd be a cost in doing that. It's not one I'm frightened of. Because I actually think that before the Europeans would allow that situation to arise, they would look very carefully at how much money they were going to lose from us. And that, I mean, I've always argued, and I argued this when I showed it for Secretary, is a lever that no British government has ever been prepared to use in negotiations. It's about the time we did. Uh, and that, 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 that's my view. But I, I, mean, I do think that there is a possibility, if we came out, that they, they could put tariffs up against us. And that, that would have some effect on us. But we've got to, to me, and what I said earlier, that to me is the last, the last step down the road. Uh, I would like to be more positive and think we can get an arrangement with Europe, even if it's an associated membership one, that will allow that not to have to happen. Gentlemen at the back. Isn't it, isn't it a fact that we in this country purchase more from Europe than Europe actually purchases from us? I mean, we purchase their BMWs, their Mercs, Champagne, all these sort of things. Would they really put uh, 
a block on us if we came out from dealing with them. I mean, they'd be losing all that money, wouldn't they? I can't, I can't really see why they would do that. I'm not saying they would. What I'm saying is it's possible. I mean, they certainly they could if they wanted to. I mean, we could yeah, I mean, them. yeah. Well, yes, but if we're selling less, less, less to them than they're selling to us, they, they might reckon that was quite a good bargain. The reason why I, I, I don't want to be specific about this is this is one of the imponderables we don't know. And we don't know till we get there. And what I was saying is rather than talking about them and us, what I would like to see is us taking this process forward on a basis of civilised and rational discussion with them. And I think if we do that uh, in the way the world's changing at the moment, we could well find that we can get further towards where we want to get to than we ever thought possible before. But if we, if, we, if we merely sit and concentrate on saying there's them on one side and us on the other, we can be sure that we're never going to find some of the accommodations that I think we should be looking for. Yes, I'd just, just like to say on what you've just said there, uh, isn't Giscard d'Estaing, if I pronounce that correctly, isn't he sympathetic to the, your view that we should be a bit detached from the from the um, European Union and, uh, and, and implement some of our own laws and, uh, and our own economy and so forth. I think he's come out and said, said something about yeah, that. He, he, he said it because we said we didn't like his, his baby. Uh, we said we didn't like the Constitution. And this was his moment Philadelphique, and he said, well, if you don't like it, go away. Uh, I don't think that was the view necessarily of his government. Uh, um, he, he's... He has a romantic view of life, does Giscard, and I think that was part of his, his romanticism. Mm -hmm. Gentleman at the back. Back. Uh, to back. Yes, During the recent meltdown of all the financial services, the politicians on Capitol Hill were, were very vocal and certainly made their presence felt. Westminster was deserted. Nothing happened. No, no uh, interaction, as far as one could see. Uh, Given that, those circumstances, and what happened with particularly MPs' expenses uh, earlier in the year, does the British public have any right to expect better from our Parliament? And that's up to the British public. If they have elections, they're free to elect whoever they decide to elect. And if they're dissatisfied with those they have at the moment, they're entitled to vote for other people. Uh, the, on, the, on the specific reason why we weren't as... Uh, active as, as the Congress was. There were two reasons. One is the Congress has powers uh, uh, which they, they could actually operate themselves in terms of what was done by, by the government. The Bush could not have got his bailout through without, as you know, the consent of Congress. In Parliament, th that is not required. The government is drawn from Parliament. It's the majority in Parliament. It can do it without calling Parliament back. The second reason was Congress was sitting at the time, and we weren't. It was four days before we were called back. My argument has been since we were called back, the government has not had a full day debate on the economic situation at the moment. And I and a number of others are pressing not only for a one-day debate on it, but a two-day debate. We think it's serious enough to merit that. So we don't really have a very vibrant democracy compared with the United States? Well, at that particular moment, they're now in recess, so we will now be discussing things they're not. I could make the same point the other way around. But I do think we've got to be seen to be, to be involved in this debate. But our systems are different. They have to actually agree in legislation, the bailout. We didn't have to. They had to be called. Uh, they, in fact, they were going out of session at that moment. They had to stay in session until they passed that bill. They stayed in session for another two days in order to do it. Th that is not required of the British Parliament. If you want to change the British Constitution, then that's another argument. I think we've had a pretty full innings from Michael today, don't you? I will allow two more speakers, fresh ones if possible, not ones who hold the mic all the time. Anybody at the back want to speak? Anybody else? There's one there. Right. David, one for you. There's one there. Oh, I didn't see you. Right, yours first. Um, one of the confused is carbon emissions of global warming, is it anthropogenic or is it nat natural? What are my views on car emissions? Yes, on carbon emissions. Oh, yes. Carbon emissions. Global, global warming. Carbon emissions, well, there's no doubt in my unscientific mind that there is too much carbon being emitted at the moment. The government's chief scientist made the point about a year ago that there's always been carbon emissions right throughout history, but that nature has always 
done a, a balancing thing of emitting some of the carbon into the atmosphere and burying some of it under the ground. What we've done is we've continued to emit it into the atmosphere and we've also unburied a lot of it which was buried under the ground and emitting that into the atmosphere as well. And it's that imbalance, in his view, this was David King, who was the previous government chief scientist, that has accelerated global warming. And that's something that we've got to reverse. I, I spent some time last year uh, looking at what the individual states in the United States are doing in terms of carbon capture. And that's a very interesting area, how you can actually not only capture it, but you can put it back under the ground again. And that's something which in this country I think we should be looking at very closely as well. Now, what about a lady to wind up? Question? Any question? Mm -hmm. What powers does the Queen have, still have now? Tell me, you. Um, <laughs> It, 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 it's a good question. Theoretically, she has a lot of power. Does she? Um, I mean, she, she, she can get rid of the government if she wanted to. She still can. Yeah, like, like the, the Governor General of Australia, did you remember, about 20 years ago in her name. But in practice, I mean, she, the, a, a constitutional monarch is very circumscribed because a constitutional monarch knows that if they use the powers that are available to them without looking at the broader context in which they're using them, they could well find those powers were taken away. In the end, Parliament can decide what powers the monarch has, as we saw in 1688 and, uh, 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 and from then onwards. Uh, but the balance at the moment, I think, is a good balance, including the House of Lords, which is now, as you know, under threat. I think it's right that there is a, a revising House for the House of Commons, which tends to do things rather too quickly. Uh, and I think it's absolutely right at the end of the day that we have a head of state who is not part of the party political system. And so I, I, I don't see too much need for change. She's just signed her sovereignty away, hasn't she? Well, Brown, of course, forced her to sign this damn constitution thing. She gives away her sovereignty, or crack you yeah, but, but, but we, we might well ask her to sign it back again afterwards. Um, th that is a legal question. I could spend hours and hours on the legal questions of, to do with sovereignty. What I said earlier is sovereignty is what you assert. And I go back to that. I, I went to Gibraltar when the government was trying to share Gibraltar's sovereignty with the Spanish. And I said that sovereignty shared is sovereignty surrendered. Not legally, but in practice. And therefore, if you want your sovereignty, you have to assert it. And the people of Gibraltar got up and did precisely that in a referendum. And the Spanish are now having to deal with them on that basis. Well, I think we are very grateful to Michael for covering a lot of ground today. And with, I think, tantamount to a fresh approach to some of our problems. In fact, he's been so good on how to deal with Europe, to extract ourselves one way or another, that we ought to propose him as chief negotiator. 